we're back. After some small technical difficulties, this is the CHGO Sky Show, part of the CHGO Sports and All City Sports Network. And as always, presented by CD1 Price Cleaners. Check out CD1 Price Cleaners around the Chicagoland area for low prices, simple, transparent service, fast turnaround, and a wide variety of services, not just dry cleaning, including washing and folding laundry, doing blankets, comforters, tailoring, alterations, leather cleaning, and area rug cleaning. Visit chgo.cd1.com. That's chgo.cdone.com and pick up your exclusive pickup or delivery coupon. We're back in the building. It's Christopher Pennant. It's Stephen Garner, the best X's and O's man this side of the Mississippi, and our erstwhile producer on the day, Stephen Nicholas, behind the boards. Stephen and Stephen, how y'all doing? I'm doing great, man. Like I said, there's a lot of great basketball going on. Perfect time of the year for that. If you are truly like a fan of basketball at all levels, we got obviously on the college circuit, the women's and men's side, NBA playoffs right around the corner, ramping up next week with the play-in tournament, bleeding into the first round of the playoffs. WNBA draft coming up that at the beginning of next week as well. Media day coming shortly thereafter with training camp and the season on the way. Whole lot of hoop, whole lot of hoop, man. Be blessed. <laughs> well, no doubt. I, the weather was good enough that I went outside. I was going past Hornet Park, and I stopped on the basketball court. Did something I have not done since I was 15 years old, which is play basketball in jeans. That was a mistake. Oh, yeah, I got real dehydrated. But, <laughs> yeah, uh, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> I hit, I hit a hook shot, and I played some good defense. Kept up with these high schoolers, so I was feeling pretty good about myself. You probably took the only shot inside the three point line the whole game, too, didn't you? Dog, Steph Curry has, <laughs> has truly ruined the game, bro. I'm so serious. That's wild. <laughs> so Steph Curry and Caitlin Clark yep. changed the these these dudes are shooting contested rainbow three point shots. And like they they I swear my man did the Nick Young turnaround on one of them that he missed badly too. It's crazy. See, that's that's why I only hoop in private runs at this. At this big old age of mine, at 28, I only hoop in, open, in pro, um, <laughs> private runs these days. <laughs> Y'all see me shaking my head. He said this, this at big old age of 28. Man, wait, <laughs> wait, wait till your ankles start to betray you. Don't, hey, don't hey I reviewed me. that. Don't speak that on me. No, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get to this final four talk that's leading into next week's WNBA draft because there was some impressive basketball being played in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, all the final four teams, North Carolina State, UConn, Iowa, and the eventual champion, South Carolina, were impressive. But what stood out to you most on that last weekend of the college the college season? And for me, honestly, is all the attention. Attention from all different walks of basketball, men's side, women's side, uh, collegiate teams, professional athletes with no ties to any of the teams in the final four in the championship. Obviously, alumni for, or alumnus from each specific school as well. Just everybody having a, having their eyes on the women's game and the discourse in a positive light that came from it. I don't think you could ask for much a much better stage set and how how well they deliver. You can even sprinkle into the live broadcast with Cheney and um, um, Andrea and L L Duncan. They did such a phenomenal job with just engaging and entertaining and also informing that three prong formula to consistently, you know keeping up with a strong fan base and just really, really keeping more eyes and bringing more eyes to it. It was just, just so good all around on all, all different spectrums of everything that came with the weekend. And honestly, even a weekend before last. And yeah, women's basketball is in just a great space right now uh, for individuals, but also for all of the individuals in general in tandem with one another, just kind of pinging off of one another and ultimately making the game and this past two weekends be what it was, which was, Legendary, a timestamp in women's basketball history. That's where we're at right now. Absolutely legendary. I think that's a, a great way of putting it because there's so many. When, when you look back at the history of, of women's, women's college ball in our lifetime, there were great players who came through who transcended just the college ranks like Candace Parker, uh, Brianna Stewart, Maya Moore, and going back even further than that, uh, Tamika Catchings and Rebecca, Rebecca Lobo that came out of college and just were big, big time. But the succession of players that we have now who have the chance to just make their mark, an indelible mark on history, 
is mind boggling. Like we think about the players who are in this tournament, who just came out, Caitlin Clark, who is already a transcendent talent before she's even played a pro game. Um, Camilla Cardoso, who's following on the, the following the footsteps of Aaliyah Boston, Angel Reese, who we've talked about, Flage Johnson, who we've talked about on this podcast uh, recently, and then the players who are just who are younger than that or freshmen, Juju Juju Watkins at USC, uh, Hannah Hidalgo at Notre Dame, uh, AZ Fudd at UConn, who hadn't had the chance to really play a full season, but is just still a brilliant prospect. Paige Beckers who finally was able to play a, a fairly healthy season and is staying in for another year. These players are going to be household names before it's all said and done. If, if you know, if the luck holds right, because I have my guys in my group chat, you know, most of whom are not necessarily women's basketball guys, but they were talking about some of those names that I mentioned for teams that didn't have, didn't make it to the final four, especially Juju, um, especially Han Hidalgo. They were all over that. It was the attention was there, and I think for me, just being able to watch the basketball and the way South Carolina played defense, how cohesive they were offensively and defensively. Like my partner said, they were like a machine, just like a five-person machine who were everywhere on the court. Uh, Ashlyn Watkins, who you know might have been might have played a more complete game than Cardoso, depending on how you look at it. This South Carolina team was undeniable, absolutely undeniable. It shows in their record the fact that they won the, the final game by 12 points. That's what really stood out to me, just South Carolina and Don Staley stamping their mark on this season. Yeah, I you can't overstate how impactful Don Staley and her leadership and her abilities to uh, bring a group of young women together for one goal – and to be able to focus on it with all of the distractions and noise that are easily accessible to athletes in this generation, to have everybody buy into that common goal, to bounce back from last season's shortcoming, um, which was an undefeated season up until they lost in the Final Four to Iowa, to now be able to get past that bump and get into the championship game again and now execute upon a plan while also exercising some demons that came in the form of Kayla Clark and pull up three after pull up three after driving kick after full court pass <laughs> to see them have that wherewithal and also have another kind of flashback to that game from last season that was the end of their season. Some of those things came up again in the first quarter, but nobody let go of the rope. Everybody stayed bought in. They upped the ante like you talked about with defense first and foremost and secondly and thirdly, honestly, and we saw them just attack. They went from they were a little bit more reactive earlier in the game in that first quarter. And we saw Kaylin get to 18. And they got a couple more three pointers from a handful of the other players on the Iowa Hawkeyes. They were finally able to find their footing defensively and they started attacking. And once they started attacking rather than reacting to everything that Iowa was doing, we saw a big switch in the game, starting on defense again and then bleeding into their offense from there. Yeah, Kaylin Clark. Clark. 18 points in the first quarter and then 12 over the remainder of the game. That just is a testament, not just to the defenders they had on like Raven Johnson or Malaysia for Wiley, but a defensive game plan. I'm surprised that that was apparent that they were more playing more reactive at the start of the game rather than attacking because the teams that we saw who went far in this tournament, both them and North Carolina state that use defense first, really succeeded by attacking at the perimeter and then being able to def defend or alter shots at the hole. Like North Carolina State didn't have the size and the athleticism in the interior that South Carolina did. But James and Rivers, Saniah, James, Saniah Rivers and Isaiah James, were so good at disrupting perimeter play that that's what put them into the Final Four. They dismantled Gonzaga which was a really good offensive team in the half court. And they did not allow their half court offense to get any type of rhythm or breathing room. And that was what really put them out to me. I was like, okay, I want to follow this team. Like, I want to see what they do. The only thing that held them down was that South Carolina was so athletic at the perimeter that James and Rivers weren't able to get that kind of rhythm. And the only player who was, who was really solid for them for four quarters was the freshman Zoe Brooks, another name to keep in mind um, as the years go by. But that's what was just so impressive about the whole weekend's play. Like, 
Clark was Clark. She did Clark things. But there were a lot of unsung heroes, un, you know, underrated players who might not have been on everybody's minds. But because this was had so many eyes on it, like you said, people are going to keep an eye out for those players because real, real basketball fans recognize real. And the players who made those plays, they stick in your mind. And you're like, oh, yeah, I want to follow them. Yep. I think I think a player that fits directly in alignment with that, like you mentioned, was my leisure. She's had a handful of just spark plug moments where it's never seemed like the moment was too big for her. Whether she's coming in and they got a 10-point lead and she increases that to 15 or 20, or they're down like they were early in the game against Iowa, and she scores five out of like seven or five out of eight into a timeout, and now they're within two. Just those little things like that, I feel, for a player like her, that obviously she, for anybody that watches women's basketball, you know who she is, the Steph Curry endorsement with Under Armour, all of that stuff, training with stuff, and just the general flashes of athleticism and just spark plug brilliance that she's shown over the course of the season. Even past that, winning the trust of Don Staley from not playing as much, if at all, in spurts early in the season to now regaining that trust, doing the things she needs to do, starting with defense that Dawn said was going to be her runway to getting back into the rotation, buying into that, and seeing ultimately the dynamic that she has now on a two-way that you need if you're going to be playing her against somebody like Caitlin Clark. It was it was just it was just a ton of fun to see uh, the synergy and dynamics between her and Raven Johnson. Just again, attacking, attacking, attacking on defense, and I think that's just really speaks to the coaching. Like, I don't think most coaches that Caitlin Clark went against in her collegiate career, especially when she started ascending, they, they didn't necessarily have a bad game plan. It's just hard to execute your game plan against somebody that's so great. And to see, you know, obviously South Carolina had the, the dogs in the front court or in the back court rather to do so, you know, it was beautiful to see. So great basketball. I'm glad you brought up Malaysia again, Malaysia again, because this is a player who was shouted out by Magic Johnson amongst amongst a torrent of other people for that move that she had early in the season. And she what was it? They they put up the the graphic during the game against. It might have actually been the game against Oregon State in the Elite Eight, but she was averaging about the same minutes that she did in the season 18. But she raised her three point percentage by 26 points. And her scoring average, I think, by seven points. Like she was that good in she had been that good in the tournament coming from the regular season. She's at South Carolina, which is under the microscope because everybody knows they're a championship team, even if they didn't win the championship last year. And she's a freshman who's already getting name, image, and likeness deals. For that player to perform the way that she played, one dispels any notion of players in college right now not caring enough about the game because of the money that they have coming to them. And two, that she is going to be really, really, really good because she gives a damn. I think that's what coaches look, you know, when you say coachable, I I always take that as code for a player who really cares about playing with the team and getting better as an individual. I'm excited to see what she does, man. Yeah, she she's of that that group of players that, uh, especially being a guard enthusiast the way I am, she's one of those she's one of those ones that I'm definitely gonna have, like you said, under a microscope going forward. Uh, it's just the the energy she's never lacking. Like she might be, she might go over six, she might get blown by on the possession defensively. Everybody's not perfect, but her energy <laughs> is at a, it's at a level that's almost always higher than somebody than like pretty much anybody else when she's on the floor. And that in and of itself is a weapon. That's leadership. That's accountability. Like th- all the things that you would look for in any type of lead or hybrid guard, she has that in spades. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what that, that backcourt uh, tandem of her and Raven Johnson kind of evolves into over the course of their, their collegiate careers. It's going to be a lot of fun to talk to, to watch and for us to be able to talk about. We're going to talk more about LSU and Iowa, whether they should have been on opposite sides of the bracket instead of meeting in the Elite Eight. But first, we've got to play up once again. Our sponsor, CD1 Price Cleaners. As I said before, you save over 30% on your dry cleaning bill once you switch to CD1 Price Cleaners because they're not like the dry cleaner down the street that is going to charge you nickel and dime you on alterations, tailoring, bringing your laundry in if you're on the go. And for dry cleaning, their stated purpose, but they're going to be simple have transparent service, 
and they're going to turn it around fast for you. It's going to be ready the same day or the next day rather than the two, four days, six days that other dry cleaners might have. And if you need it, they've got text alerts for you. Again, they do dry cleaning. You can bring your laundry in. They'll wash it and fold it for you. You know it's hard to fold T-shirts, jerseys, all those things, blankets, comforters. If you need those washed, they'll do it for you. They'll clean your area rugs. They'll clean leather because you got that old bomber jacket in the back of your closet or your members only that your dad passed down to you from the 80s. They'll clean all that. And if you're like me and you still grow out of some things, they'll alter, they'll do alterations and tailoring for you. So CD1 Price Cleaners, once again, that's go to chgo.cd1. That's chgo.cdone. And redeem your exclusive CHGO offer for either pickup or delivery dry cleaning service. Now, the wet is warm, Stephen. We talked about it. And it's hard not to really have fun watching watching basketball without a drink in your hand. And that's why I like Coors Light. That's why I really favor Coors Light because it's it's clear, clean, and refreshing. That rock, those blue Rocky Mountains on the can, always, always memorable. And I know that that you, when you when you sit down, even if you're taking notes, sometimes you need a break. You got to reach for that Coors Light. I agree. You got to reach for a refreshing beverage, especially with the weather getting a little bit warmer out here in Chicago. You already know. And that's why we in this show are sponsored by Coors Light. And that's why I love to take it in when I'm watching a Sky game, especially once it gets to those July months, whether you're at Wintrust Arena, whether you're at home, whether you're out with your friends watching the sky. When the mountains turn blue, it's as cold as the Rockies. Cold lager, cold filter, cold package for a smoother finish. And so when it's time to chill, open a Coors Light. That's the beer that I reach for. Get Coors Light delivered straight to your door with Instacart by going to CoorsLight.com slash CHGO Dunk. That's CoorsLight.com slash CHGO Dunk. Celebrate responsibly. Coors Brewing Company, Golden, Colorado. I think that this got lost in the shuffle that LSU Iowa game that was in the elite eight, just with how good the final four weekend was. But I saw on, um, on actually my, my partner was listening to NPR and on their marketplace segment, I'm not sure who the guest was, but they were saying that those teams should have been on opposite sides of the bracket. So they had the chance to meet again in the final four rather than playing it out in the elite eight. Did you have any, have any thoughts on that? Do you think it was a mistake by the NCAA? NCAA? I mean that that means that LSU needs to win more games than they than they actually did in the regular season. So you know they you know you 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 play the hand that you dealt, but you also kind of play a part in the the hand that you are dealt when it comes to your ranking, uh, looking at the national tournament. So if LSU finished where they were supposed to. It should have I mean with the talent they had and coming off of a championship. In addition to that, they should have been a number one. They should have been a number one seed. Obviously, those things aren't given. Those are earned. And, you know, I think it was maybe Bobby Knight that said you are what your record is, especially once you get to a late portion in the season. You know, so you just got to you gotta deal with where it's at there. But they had a direct opportunity to go up against that same team that they put out. You know, we saw a different, different, different go about it this time around. But, yeah, I don't I don't know. I'm not one for <laughs> for a giving. In terms of records and whatnot, everything is earned, just like all the other teams, like North Carolina State, who didn't have an easy deck of cards handed to them. Handed to them, they had to go out and handle their business, and they did their job. So, yeah, I can't say more than that. And I think that was a great showcase for for Iowa, um, and also for for me personally, a great showcase for Kim Mulkey's coaching um, acumen. Because let's just call it what it was. Putting Haley Van Lith on Caitlin Clark for 36 minutes of that game was a mistake. Capital M, capital E, capital everything mistake. Mistake! Just like, I don't, I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why she kept her out there. And I know that that was the most watched game for a number of reasons, not least of which... Um, is the Iowa fans versus, uh, let's say, the people who did not want necessarily to see Iowa win. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody, I, I can't say this on the air. I, I got to leave that one alone. 
<laughs> but just from a basketball standpoint, Haley was was overmatched. She was just completely overmatched out there. And Caitlin did what she was supposed to do and um, put her on a spit and put her over the fire. And that was like the best Caitlin Clark game. What was you put up 41 points in that game? Yeah, it was it was it was a lot of buckets. <laughs> And it was it was in different ways too. She was getting a lot of people involved, and I think that's what gets lost sometimes when you look at the scoring numbers. That it, when you compare it to Steph Curry, it's not just that she shoots from long range; it's that she distributes the ball well. She finds other players and gets them involved in the game. And so while it, it sucked to see Angel Reese get that early ankle injury, and then she she wasn't necessarily the same after that. I think LSU would have been in better shape in that game had they just said, okay, Flau J, we need you to play both ways and you got to slow down Caitlin Clark in some way for us. Yeah, there's like there's a lot of things that you could have countered to if you're if you're Kim Moki. Um problem is though, for every reaction that you're gonna have to Caitlin, you better believe she has a couple things in her bag to put herself in a position of again dictating to an opponent's defense. And you know, she's she's one of the she's a cream of the crop premier fire starter. Um, and it, it doesn't help that she's also a lead guard. So more often than not, she has the ball in her hand either directly to start a possession, which is naturally putting pressure on your defense because you have to pick her up at half court, or if she's running off of screens and running off of handoff variations and all of that fun stuff. There's gravity that comes with that. So she's always in a state, in a position of dictating. And, you know, regardless of who you who might start her with, uh, who might start guarding her on a possession, I can talk, I promise. <laughs> regardless of that, with how many screens she runs off of and whatnot, and how the pace and tempo that she moves at, especially in the half court, more often than not, you're going to have to switch. So, you know, it's, there's, there's, there's a lot of you could have did this and that, but I mean, she had 41. Who's to say any of that would have worked on that specific night, you know? That's very true. My man, Jacob Kenobi, in the chat. Shout outs to you, man. From Decorah, Iowa. He's a, a long, a lifelong Hawkeyes fan. So Kate Martin played the best game of her life, too. And that's very true. I think that that's something else that got lost in there, too. Just the supporting cast for Iowa. Really excited to see Gabby Marshall as she comes along. She's kind of like a low-grade Jordan Canada right now just at the start of her career and so as she develops more of a shot and keeps improving her defense and honestly probably grows another inch or two too it's going to be fun to see her playing playing against uh quality guards um uh my friend meg fenway also in the chats and can't spell mulkey without an l mm -hmm. we, we don't we don't have time to go into the washington post article and the la times article because those were big news i was talking with my cousins out in california who are big fans of women's hoop but uh, suffice it to say that just in the basketball side, Kim Mulkey, um, she she kind of played herself. It was it was unfor it was unfortunate to see for LSU and their fans because I thought they had a real shot to at least go back to the Final Four. And I think she just put them all on the back foot with those decisions. That that was that was weird. Yeah, that it was definitely like obviously on court, Kaylin dominated, and more often than not, in the especially in the the tournament, once you get to like the Sweet Sixteen, Elite Eight, Final Four, championship, even more so, if you have the best player on the court, that drastically shifts so much of your chances of winning a game. It's quite literally why Iowa was able to win a lot of the games that they did the last two seasons in the tournament, specifically because of the star firepower. Like I talked about. Kaylin Clark is a premier fire starter. And more often than not, she's going to be the best player on the floor. And when she is, it's very loud and it's very disruptive. And I think past that, like you talked about, things that can kind of get lost, some of the individual talents that come with that, the coaching from Iowa. I feel like Kim Moki was outcoached. And, yeah. again, so if you have the best player on the court and you're outcoaching your opponent on top of that, and now you got your pieces – all of your ancillary pieces are all firing at all cylinders. You're getting contributions from your other guards, from your posts, directly from Caitlin, but also independent of Caitlin. And then your reserves are coming in and chipping in at the bare minimum as well. You know, that's a lot. That's a lot to overcome. 
one after another after another. You only have to, you have to be able to concede one and take away the rest if you're an opponent. LSU definitely had the dogs on paper to do so. You know, they just didn't have the execution or the coaching, in my opinion, to overcome that again. And honestly, I think there was there was some conversation about it on Twitter, discourse wise, that you know, Kayla had a good game against LSU last year as well, but they were just she they Iowa was outcoached by Ken Mokey. And now the tables kind of turned in addition to Kaylin obviously having another great game, a better game this time around. So, you know, that's that's definitely a big piece in it as well. You're not going to locate a player like Caitlin Clark unless – well, the, with the transfer portal, I think you'll have the opportunity for quality players like Haley Van Haley Van Lee at the transfer portal pretty much as soon as that game was over. Mm-hmm. I, I shouldn't laugh. It's just it, – it's, it's available. It's, 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 it's preserved in history that she got mm-hmm. cooked on national TV. But I want to see how this matchup goes forward. Like Iowa and LSU – as long as they keep developing and bringing in good players, that's a matchup that you could play every season out of conference the way that they used to have UConn and Tennessee. And you have personalities who I think the fans of their teams and even people who aren't fans of their teams can really get behind. Before we go to our next break, we're going to keep talking about Caitlin Clark because she's coming in the league. Uh, Diana Tarasi ha- had things to say as well as Don Staley. I think both of them are talking about her star power, uh, but this is something that we, uh, Kevin Kaduk and I talked about on uh, Tavern Style yesterday. Another one from Jacob Layla. Felia from Michigan is a great portal app for someone all Big Ten. Yeah, that transfer portal is going to be real interesting to watch in this offseason for college. Uh, mm-hmm. But going back to Caitlin, the potential for her star power to elevate the league um, Dawn Staley said pretty, she said point blank that she's somebody who elevates the game and will have the chance. And she hopes that she continues to elevate, um, every step of the way as her career moves forward. And then Diana Taurasi you know, being Diana, when, when Scott Van Pelt asked her on ESPN said she, you know, she wants Cleveland to do well to say that her game will translate, but it's going to be different playing against grown women. It's like, you look superhuman playing against 18 year olds. What you have, what do you think about where Caitlin's – how is she going to look in the league? Uh, well, one thing that's certainly going to translate is shooting. And shooting from range and also shooting off of movement. Those are two things that because of how uh, fine-tuned her skill in that specific department and shooting in all contexts, that's going to translate. Now, I think something that's underrated about Caitlin's game that was dominant – on the collegiate circuit that won't be as dominant right away until she's able to kind of fill out her body more just off of strength is going to be her drives because the counter to her shooting naturally uh, attracting the most urgent of closeouts from sometimes from multiple defenders is her ability to, to counter that when teams take away the three point line, get into the paint. And then she has an array of soft touch floaters, finishing ability and also drive and kick, drive and dish, uh, drive and dump off. She has all of that in her bag on the collegiate circuit. I think that particular dynamic of her offensive uh, firepower and arsenal is going to be is going to see an adjustment period. It'll certainly be there, but it's going to take some work for her to get it to even close to the level it was on the collegiate level. Again, just off of maturing as a young woman, taking those reps, getting knocked down a handful of times, not getting that same type of whistle that she got on the collegiate level in the W. Those That's things, good. yes, those things in terms of um, just transitioning into the W as well as her skill development and body development are things that are going to kind of be a little bit behind the A ball initially. Um, but I do think, like, I think a perfect case study and example is Dana Evans. We looked at Dana Evans last season, and what was, what was one of the biggest things I talked about with her? Her drives, she was dictating and initiating contact on almost every single one. Whereas last season and the season before that, she would kind of sh- not not shy away from contact. She just didn't have that ability to absorb the contact and dictate with that contact to where she's able to finish the way that she was this past season. I think that's for Sky fans an exact an example uh, of kind of what to what to look at for Caitlin as she transitions to the W. I think she'll get there, but it's just gonna take a little while for her to get to that point. Not unlike we saw with Dana. Most definitely. We got more Caitlin Clark talk and if the sky's draft board has changed after the final four, right after this from prize picks. 
if you want to get in on the – well, now that the collegiate season is over, I hope you use prize picks, but the NBA playoff season is heating up and the WNBA season is only about a month away. So you want to download prize picks, the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America, and the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. It's not you against another person. It's just you against the numbers. And instead of battling thousands of other players, including professionals and people who are always looking for that extra edge, you pick more than or less than a two to six play stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. Say if once the season comes along, you want to say Asia Wilson more or less than 10 rebounds against a team like the Dallas Wings, Alyssa Thomas more or less than six assists, John Quell Jones more or less than 20 points. Sabrina Ionescu, more or less than three threes. Caitlin Clark, more or less than five threes. Dana Evans, more or less than four threes. All of those are available to you. And you can win up to 100 times your money on prize picks as you and the world's best players take the game to a whole new level during this NBA postseason and when that WNBA season comes in. Again, that's 100 times your money, which means you can turn $10 into $1,000. That means you can turn $10 into ten thousand dollars if you want it it's all out there for you prize picks has something for every sports fan from basketball to hockey to league of legends my man jake in the chat i know you play that lol so you can get in on all that too i've been playing prize picks the last couple months and while i haven't gotten about thousand dollar heights i've been getting some nice chunks of change back through it back to me so go to prizepicks.com slash CHGO and use the code CHGO for a first deposit match up to $100. That's prizepicks.com slash CHGO and use that code CHGO. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Prize picks. And for the diehards, if you're not a diehard yet, man, Steven, tell them they need to be a CHGO diehard. And missing out on content if you're not, man. Dead serious. Like, not only can you get first looks at articles from our very own Stephen Garner, both here on, on the Chicago Sky and on the Phoenix Suns. Shh. A man writes about the Phoenix Suns in depth. You can't miss out on it. But you'll be able to check out our CHGO Bears guys who are coming up on the NFL draft, and you can celebrate in historic fashion as they team up with former Bear Corey Wooten, Northwestern's own, and for a Bears live show at the NFL for the NFL draft that Joe's on Weed Street. That is Thursday, April 25th, and Friday, April 26th, both presented by Circa and Casa Azul. So you, you got to get on it. You got to get on it. There's going to be a lot of things on there for you, including exclusive CHGO merch. So head to allchgo.com. That's allchgo.com to learn more about what you can get as a CHGO diehard, whether you're a White Sox fan, Sky fan, Bears fan, Cubs fan, Blackhawks fan, Red Stars fan, or more, you want to be a CHGO diehard. Podcasts and live shows on every single team, every single day, 20% off all CHGO exclusive events and a members-only Discord and a free shirt when you become a member. CHGO diehard. Get to it. Matt, there was a really good segment yesterday Today, from, from um, WWE Commissioner Kathy Engelbert on CNBC, where they asked her not just about Caitlin Clark's star power and how that could ha- uh, affect the league, but also they, I was really ha- heartened to see this. They kind of pressed her about the, the potential revenue from the new TV deals and how that would affect both player salaries and player amenities, including charter flights and, uh, you know, other, uh, not just salaries, but, Better locker rooms, things that players have been talking about. Better locker rooms, better facilities. Uh, so first, Caitlin Clark and the new TV deals, including the one, uh, the extension with Amazon and the one that the league signed with Discovery Plus to broadcast games overseas. How does this all tie in? Like, how do you see Caitlin and other young players coming in, like bringing the league forward in terms of revenue? Well, again, like we talked about earlier uh, and what stood out to me, from this past weekend and honestly the past two or three weekends, it's just the visibility and the accessibility. Having more eyes on the game, having more people engaged, having more people knowing these players, knowing their abilities, knowing their background stories. There's The more access, the better. You can never hurt yourself by allowing too much access uh, on a worldwide spectrum. There's been a lot of attention uh, from the W, specifically in the North American borders, 
And even uh, you can also obviously talk about Canada with that as well. But just generally over in this hemisphere of the world, looking at the attention that the women's game has been garnering the last couple of years, it's been important. And the access has been rampantly uh, just get, just been better. And I'd like to see them expanding it border wise past just this side of the globe and taking it international and doing it with like an emphasis to where, you know, you're making these things a lot more streamlined for people because people want to watch. That's part of it. Now it's about giving them the opportunity to do so in a way that is not going to hurt the viewership, giving them something like a stable stream to watch games, something that they can consistently rely on. They can see it in HD. It's 2024. Should be watching games in 360 or 480 or 1080 if that's if that's the case. It should be nothing less than 4K, to be honest. And I just feel like, again, that accessibility and having something consistent for them to dive in with is important. I mean, not just uh, for that Discovery Plus deal where uh, viewers in the UK and Ireland are able to watch 16 games, which will be broadcast in prime time, um, not on tape delay, which means that those the, the folks who want to stay up until 10 or 11 at night to watch these games are able to. But the all-star game and all playoff games, I think that's the biggest thing because when I talk to people who are kind of like, eh, or halfway on women's basketball, they say, well, you know, I want to watch the playoffs. The same way that people talk about the NBA who are, you know, uh, not basketball fans or more hockey fans are like, well, we want to watch the postseason. So now the postseason is available and you get to watch the best be the best when it's time for the best to work. And I think that's really important too. Uh, also, now we, we got to get to the draft because I think we kind of belabored the point talking about these other players. But you put this in when we were preparing for the show. Should the sky choose Camilla Cardoso at the number three pick or Rakia Jackson as the number three pick? And I don't think this would have been a question as of two weeks ago, but it's, it's a lot more on the table now, I think, in terms of how, of how Camilla Cardoso played, how well she played during the tournament. And you see our stats up here just for, this, for the season. Actually, okay, this one, as, that might be my, my mistake on that one. That one's reversed. The Jackson stats are on the right and the Cardozo are on the left. Uh, Camilla with just under 15 points, just under 10 rebounds and two assists per game. That's a big number. And quality shooting percentage from the field. And then Rikia Jackson at 28 and, and two, uh, just under 50% from the field, 78% from the line. I, I've got some thoughts on this, but what are your thoughts? Should the sky t who should the sky take at number three? Uh, I've literally been splitting hairs on this since um, since I put it in the chat. I think it was yesterday. Just in kind of thinking, it would be tough. I think um, if this is assuming that both are available with that third pick, because for all we know, uh, we could see somebody potentially swoop in and take Camilla, or obviously potentially take Rakia as well. But assuming both are on the table. I'm still going to side with Rakia, but I want to dive into why Camilla is extremely relevant on this. I feel like I've said more than enough on two or three episodes now about everything that is Rakia, how she projects forward, and what her fit and context looks like with the Chicago Sky uh, under Teresa Witherspoon. I think I've said enough about her, so kind of just looking at it from a Camilla lens. Last season, the Sky gave up, they gave up the most attempts in the restricted area, and they also gave up the most makes in the restricted area defensively. Now, obviously, that's not a direct indictment because they had one of the better, and she finished, I think, second team uh, all defense in Elizabeth Williams last season. That's more of that's more of an indictment against their perimeter defense and how lacking it was in moments over the course of games last season. Nonetheless, I believe Elizabeth Williams is 6'3. And Camilla is 6'7". So you take a younger player that obviously is going to be a learning curve with Camilla. But if you take somebody like her that can learn from literally everything that Elizabeth Williams has compiled accolade-wise, all the intricacies of defense, how to be active, um, and just have somebody that Camilla could potentially like learn from, no different than Dana Evans learned from Courtney Vandersloot and all the years she spent under her tutelage, it would be kind of a similar type of relationship there. Camilla can learn from one of the best at her position on the defensive end. Obviously, defense is where she shines and what's gotten her to the point, to the dominant force that she's been on the collegiate level the last two seasons. Now, 
I think that would be a that would be something positive for Teresa Witherspoon to build out her defensive base with, and a younger player that's given that bigger size in the front court that the Sky have desperately needed uh, for a handful of seasons now. And I think there will be obviously a changing a changing of the anchor in terms of having Camilla integrated into everything that Teresa wants to do. But I do think that there's a lot of potential there, and I think it all starts on the defensive end. Um, before I kind of dive into it more, I'm curious what are your thoughts on Camilla with this guy? And, you know, if you had the choice, if they're both available, who are you choosing between her and Rakia? Well, first, first and foremost, I want you to add Esquire to your title because that was a very good argument for why this guy should take Camilla, honestly. <laughs> I, I, I really, I, you literally cannot go wrong. So this is a this is an excellent, you know, issue to have. You can't go wrong with either one or the two, in my opinion. Like Marlo Stanfield said, or like Chris Partlow said, one of them good problems. I was looking up Camilla and, and Rakia's stats. Uh, on college basketball or on basketball reference, I should say, for that comparison graphic. And I noticed something that struck me. Uh, Camila Cardoso started out at Syracuse as a freshman before transferring to South Carolina. And her freshman year at Syracuse and this past year at South Carolina were her only two years where she started a majority of the games. Actually, I think she came off the bench for her sophomore and junior seasons. In every game, she hit the floor. And those statistics are remarkably similar. They're almost identical, which doesn't mean that she didn't improve. It just means that she was doing the same things freshman year that she was doing senior year. And on the one side, that is impressive for a freshman to come in, whether they're six, seven or not, and to be playing that way against high level competition. You know, it's, it's the ACC still, which means she was playing against Virginia Tech, North Carolina State and Duke. She was playing against good programs. On the other hand, I, I want to see more improvement from those two years. I honestly would want to, you know, I, I feel like even with the system that they had in South Carolina where she wasn't needed to step outside, I would like to see more offensively from further out from the basket. And that's why I, I really want Rakia Jackson. I think Camilla would work well just in her ability to be a screener and re-screener in offensive sets, which I think would simplify things for uh, this team that needs to find its footing fairly fast and has good perimeter players such as uh, Marina Mabry and Don, uh, sorry, Dana Evans. <laughs> Don, I love Don, it. Don, 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 Don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> and Dana Evans who want to step outside and take that three-point shot. But I think you still got to replace uh, Kalia Copper's offense. And you have to, as they to borrow a term from Moneyball, replace it in the aggregate. And you can do that more quickly and easily with Rakia Jackson. She's not going to – I'd be surprised if she comes out averaging like 17 points per game or something like that. But even if you get 12 from a rookie with her size and skill set, and she did shoot just, I think, just under 34% this year, but 41% last year. I think she's a player who could really add a, a solid offensive dynamic and still be molded into a quality defensive player, again, with her, her size and skill set. If you get 65% of Ryan Howard out of Rakia Jackson, you've landed a number three pick that made good. And so that's why I would take her over, over Camilla Cardoso. Sorry to Mech Fenway. I, I just think that she's the better pro-ready pick. Yeah, I, I do think that – Again, like I prefaced before I before I spoke on Camilla, I do think that Rakia is the pick for this guy. Um, I think she has defensively the potential to be somebody that's above average, if not potentially flirt with uh with the all W style of uh defensive level of play. She has the athleticism, she has the size to play and guard multiple positions, um, to potentially switch. She can play up. Um, I, I think there's just so much on the table with Rakia. And I think her projecting forward and looking at where the W is as a whole, we're starting to see the crop of players where the bigger, um, more versatile offensive type of pieces are the ones that are driving forces. Obviously, Asia Wilson at the head of that, she's a four that can play the five. And because she can play up a position and hold her own and then some, like we saw last season and the season before, in her two seasons, 2-0 in terms of winning championships under Becky Hammond, 
I think that's like a that's a case study. Now, obviously, Rakia is not necessarily the power forward that Asia is. She's a little bit more of a wing than she is a like a true front court piece that that's playing near the blocks and, and underneath the elbows more than anything. Nonetheless, I think it's an example of kind of the type of player getting. And I think like you like you spoke to as well. You look at Ryan Howard. That's another another example of the type of player that's coming into the W and really starting to really change things. And honestly, the yeah, the yeah. the game the game changers. You know, if you look even past that, players like Diana Tarazi, she's a guard. She obviously played lead guard as well, but she spends a lot of time on the wing as well, working off of different types of actions. Rikia fits into that mold. Obviously, it's going to take some grooming, some skill development, and just generally building up reps. But the potential is we've seen it all from her. Seen it, we've seen it all. So yeah, I think I think Rakia is the pick still. But I think uh I think Camilla definitely raised her hand, like, are you sure? And he gave just enough <laughs> to think about it. Because I do think that for as easy as it is to build around and obviously see the potential in Rakia, I think you could still build fairly well around Camilla. And it wouldn't be like a compensatory, okay. I guess we'll go with Camilla because somebody else took Rakia. You feel confident if you have either one of those two. And again, like I kind of started everything with, you can't go wrong with either one of those two. I agree. And again, I, I don't think it would have been a question a couple of weeks ago, but Camila Cardoso, she impressed me last year, but she really impressed me this year. Again, in those games, I was able to watch her ability to screen, rescreen, run the floor, be present in every offensive and defensive play. And even with a team around her that would have been reduced effectively if she was not there, but still would have been a very good team. She did, st- she did stand out. I, I would be interested to see how she comes in at this game or at this, at this level. And, ooh, nice comment in the chat uh, from NFCO. I have classes at, at USC. That's where you – those coastal differences. At USC with Bree Hall and Mylasia Full Wiley, they can't say enough good things about Camilla, can't teach player size. And that's, that's true. That's true. You can't teach, you can't teach being 6'7". That is very, very true. Uh, we've got some great things coming up next week. Want to finish out with one shot here about the Caitlin Clark effect, which we talked about a little bit ago. If you check Game Time, a former sponsor of this show, for the tickets for the Indiana Fever Chicago Sky matchup on June 23rd, you'll see that the cheapest available ticket upstairs in the second level at Wintrust Arena is $104 right now. Now, you say what you want about ticket resellers and people buying up and snapping those up. But the way that Iowa got out for this game, you saw it on on the uh, the first Final Four game, NC State versus South Carolina, where you knew that there were a lot of Iowa fans who bought tickets behind their, uh, their bench. They are traveling. And with Chicago being the Big Ten town that it is, you see our producer, Stephen Nicholas, getting those highest and lowest tickets, the, the highest value ticket. This was up from what I looked at earlier. $1,437 each, each, and that's the view from the ticket. That is not nearly the best seat at Wintrust. You're not sitting next to Eric Nemchak. You're not sitting next to the dude. Shout out, the Eric. <laughs> you're, you're, you're not courtside, but people are putting up these tickets for nearly $1,500. This, this is wild. It speaks to where, where the game is transcending to, and it speaks to – just how much more attention is being garnered by the game. And it's for the happenings on court, which I I I just can't say enough about. We all know those people that were watching women's basketball because they thought a player might have been attractive to them or whatever the case may be. The fact that it's solely about the hoop, all about the hoop, just can't put a value on that. So this is a beautiful thing to see people coming out to truly watch basketball. And that's what you want more than anything else. Obviously all of those other things come with it, but the hoop first and foremost, taking precedent over everything else, people coming to see a show and Caitlin's bringing that and then some. <laughs> Most definitely. And we'll be delving into that and more next Monday night when we have the first CHGO Sky Draft Night show will be on the air at 6 p.m. Central Time. Myself in the studio, and we're looking forward to seeing our man Stephen Garner live at Chicago Sky Draft headquarters at Revolution Brewing on Kedzie. So if you're up by there, go stop in, say hi to Stephen. Don't distract him from his work, but tell him shout out and good job. 
But tune in for the CHGO Sky Draft Show, which will be next Monday, April 15th, starting at 6 o'clock, running all the way till 8. We'll analyze every Chicago Sky pick from the first round to the second round, talk about where the big, big-time big players, where they land and how they will be. And we'll have special guests on. We can't say who yet, but we know you're going to love it. So, again, tune in to CHGO Sky for the CHGO Sky Draft Show next Monday, April 15th, starting at 6 p.m., Central Time. That's our show for today. For the man, Stephen Nicholas. For the man, Stephen Garner. Check him out on the flag football field, unless you're playing defense, in which case just uh, take the day off because it's not it's not happening for you. <laughs> and uh, I want to throw a special shout out to our, our, our staff member, friend of the show, Connor Moore, picked up the shirt from State Champs. Check out the collection if you haven't already. Big ups to Connor, keep doing your thing, and check out the CHGO Red Stars show as the NWSL season heats up. From everybody at CHGO Sports and the All City Sports Network, this has been the CHGO Sky Show. Until next time, folks, be good. Do great things. Keep your head above the clouds. Never give up. Never surrender. We all city like the mayor. 